you. It's great to be here uh, today with you. Uh, let me first by, start by saying that this uh, New York City courts and how they work is a little bit of a misnomer because the city courts are really part of a state a court system. So there aren't separate courts in New York City and separate courts outside the city. It's all one state court system. So we're going to focus on the courts in New York City, but within the context of this statewide court system of which uh, I was the chief judge and is uh, even seasoned lawyers have trouble describing this court system because it's, um, it's very complex and um, with the state of the art around the country is to have one trial court in New York State, uh, including New York City, we have nine or 11 trial courts depending on how you count them. So uh, we'll do kind of a little bit of a survey course uh, tonight on it. Uh, but again, the most experienced lawyer couldn't tell you all the courts that we have, have in New York. So why don't we put up that first uh, chart, which will show you the courts in New York. So there are, I would divide them into um, superior and lower courts. The superior courts are, these are all trial courts on this side. Um, superior, the trial courts, the Supreme Court is the general jurisdiction trial court. It's a court of unlimited jurisdiction. It can handle any kind of case uh, up to any amount of money. The Court of Claims is a court in which uh, claims are brought against the state of New York. The family court is domestic disputes, children, uh, that kind of thing. It, but that court cannot grant divorces. Uh, the surrogates court is about dead people. You know, when you die, you go into surrogates court, they probate your will, and, and that's what happens there. And those four courts plus um, the county court, that's, uh, that you see there, which is a court outside New York and a city that handles felony kinds of courts, uh, ser cases, serious criminal cases, are what I would call the superior courts and the so-called lower courts are the New York City criminal court, New York City civil court, misdemeanors on the criminal side, uh, cases under $25,000 on the civil side, and then we have district courts, which are similar to those courts in New York City for Long Island, and city courts, which are outside New York City, handling lower level, less money involved, and less serious crimes. And then the town and village courts, which are the really local courts in upstate New York uh, that handle you know, arraignments uh, for a crime or, or a very local kind of offense. So those are your, depending on if you count the town and village courts, your 11 different courts. And then the appellate courts are the Court of Appeals that I was the chief judge of the state and the chief judge of the New York State Court of Appeals, which was the highest court in the state. And I'll show you how cases get up to there. And then there's an intermediate appellate court called the Appellate Division. There are four different appellate divisions in the state of New York and I'll tell you where they are. And then there's the appellate term, which is a lower level intermediate appellate court. All you really have to remember is there are a whole bunch of trial courts and there are many fewer uh, appellate courts with the Court of Appeals being the high court of the state. So let's go to the, to the next uh, uh, PowerPoint, which shows you in a civil case and, and we're not going to get complicated. In its simplest form, cases start out in the trial courts, right? The lower part here. The, the um, what I call the superior courts, when there are appeals, if you lose your case and you want to appeal, you can go up to the appellate division, you see it up there, which handles appeals from the superior courts. And then if you still lose there, you can go up to the high court, the Court of Appeals, where I was the chief judge and the head of the judicial system in New York. And with civil cases, 
in New York City, um, if, you, if you have an appeal, you go up to the appellate term, which you see there in the middle, and the first and second departments. The first department is based in Manhattan. The second department is based in Brooklyn. And if you're in one of those lower courts outside New York City, you go, you appeal, you go through the county court, and then you go up to the appellate division and to the Court of Appeals. Um, it looks complicated, it's not. You get the trial courts, you have an appeal. Depending on where you are in the state, whether you're in New York City or outside, you go to maybe a different appellate court and then eventually go up to the Court of Appeals. Let's see the next slide, which does the same thing for the criminal court structure. And same idea. You have, depending on where you are, you go either to the appellate division, the appellate term, or the county court, and then ultimately you go to the highest court. So simple, bunch of trial courts all over the city, all over the state. You go there first, then you go up to appellate court, and then you could go up to the Court of Appeals. There are different rules of how you get there, but basically that's the way it works, both for similar, civil and criminal cases. So, Let's go to the next slide, which will give you a very little bit of history. Um, we have two slides, one that gives um, a sort of really broad-braced timeline for the history of the courts. We have another one in the back of it that I'll show you in a minute. But basically, in simplest form, the first courts, before there was a high court, there was a court of general sessions in New York City in, the, in, in um, in 1683, before we had the United States of America, there were courts in New York. Um, and outside the city, the court called the Court of Chancery. In 1691, the Supreme Court that we talked about before, in New York, the Supreme Court is not supreme, right? It's a trial court of general jurisdiction. That was established in 1846. The High Court, the Court of Appeals that I headed, was established by the Constitutional Convention. The first uh, chief judge of the Court of Appeals was John Jay, who you all should know that name, who eventually became the first chief justice of the United States of America. So um, that's 1846. Then in 1894, we established those four appellate divisions that I mentioned before, the Intermediate Appellate Court, in four different areas of the state to cover the whole state. And then in 1962, um, the Constitutional Convention established this unified court system that I talked, the state court system. We call it the UCS, the unified court system in the state. And then in 1978, it'll show it on the next chart, uh, and it's a little too detailed. But tonight, just to give you an idea, in 1978, a constitutional amendment uh, put together the structure by which the courts are run. And they established something called the chief administrator, a chief administrative judge, who basically runs the court system for the chief judge in New York City, in all of New York State. I was the chief administrative judge before I became the presiding justice of the intermediate appellate court in the Manhattan, and then I became the chief judge but in 1978, we had a really uh, unified system, and they centralized the budget. So there's one budget for all the courts in New York City and New York State, and the chief judge basically controls that budget if the legislature gives him or her the money, and, and, but that uh, funds the entire state court system with including all the courts of New York City. So let's now go to a little less uh, dense subjects and go on to the next slide. And I know you've memorized everything we've done so far, but this will be um, lighter. That's the, a picture of the Court of Appeals where I presided as the chief judge in Albany. It's a beautiful uh, building. And, um, and what we would do is, and I'll explain a little bit more in a couple of minutes, we would go up to Albany when the high court was hearing cases to that court. So let's, let's go to the next. 
uh, slide. Okay, so now let's talk about the judicial branch of government um, without worrying about 1863 or all the different, you know, 97 uh, trial courts. So, you know, we have three branches of government. The executive branch is headed by the governor, right? The legislative branch, there's a state assembly which has a speaker, like they have a speaker in the House of Representatives in Washington. Um, the speaker and the majority leadership, a leader uh, are in the Senate are the heads of the legislative branch of government, and then the chief judge is the head of the judicial branch. The, um, the chief judge is appointed by the governor. So um, there's a, there's a uh, nomination commission that gives the, the governor seven names, and then the governor picks one of them to be the chief judge and head of all the courts in the state and in New York City. And the judiciary is the non-political branch. In other words, when we get on the bench, we're not Democrats, we're Repub not Republicans. I'll talk a little bit more about the independence of the judiciary and how that works. But suffice it to say that while the other two branches are big P political places, they're Republicans, they're Democrats, when you become on the bench, you lose that, you know, that idea of being uh, a political. And 75% of the judges are elected in New York, and about 25% are appointed in New York City. The family court uh, and the criminal court, those are the lower, the criminal court is the lower criminal court, the family court, the one that does children, uh, um, uh, relationships, support, you know, that one spouse may have to pay the other, um, they, they are appointed by the mayor. But most of the judges of the state are elected, and as I said, as the chief judge, I was appointed uh, by the governor. And just to give you a sense of what we do, we don't just decide the cases, which I'll talk to you a little bit about, but as the chief judge, for instance, I would uh, uh, put before the legislature, put before the public, certain initiatives that I thought were important to the justice system and the well-being of our society. For instance, um, I put out a number of proposals that are now law about wrongful convictions and how you avoid, avoid them. Someone convicted of a crime that they didn't commit. So we have some reforms that we first proposed that um, you, uh, uh, legalize the use of DNA to exonerate people, um, that provided that for any major uh, uh, crime, when the police interrogate you, it's got to be videotaped so that we can see what happened. There's no forced uh, uh, confessions. Um, juvenile justice, I advocated as the chief judge for many years to raise the age of criminal responsibility in New York from 16 years of age, which I thought in most places around the country is too young because your brain development when you're 16, 17 years old, and even later for that matter, is less mature than an adult. You don't weigh risk and consequences the way we do as adults. So I raised Let's raise the age to 18, and just recently, last year, we raised the age of criminal responsibility in New York. You may have read about it. It's a big thing, raise the age, was the rallying cry. And another example is grand jury, where I didn't succeed. You remember when the Eric Gardner case in Staten Island, and he was choked, and there was a whole big deal about it. It went before a grand jury in Staten Island, and people were frustrated because they couldn't see the minutes of the grand jury, because by our uh, uh, constitution, you can't say it. So I advocated for changing that so that people would know what happens in the grand jury, because the grand jury is such an ancient uh, institution. It goes back to the days of the Magna Carta in England that you probably all heard about centuries and centuries ago. So what the chief judge tries to do is bring the justice system up to modern times.
And another example is indigent legal defense. Um, what uh, um, criminal lawyers to defend people who are accused of crime. Uh, we want, in the United States, there's, since the case of Gideon versus Wainwright, more than 50 years ago, we know that you have a constitutional right to a lawyer if your liberty is at stake. So what we did, uh, I ruled in a case called Harold Herring that said that the present system or that upheld the continuance of a lawsuit that challenged the present system as not being sufficiently funded. And that case continued, and there was just a settlement recently that I advocated for as the chief judge to make sure that there's enough monies to fund lawyers for poor people in criminal cases. And similarly, and, and let's go to the next PowerPoint, in civil cases, there's a permanent commission on, on access to justice that I appointed, and we fought for funding for lawyers in civil cases for poor people, because poor people are literally falling off the cliff because they couldn't afford legal counsel when their home was being, you know, being evicted from their apartment, foreclosing on their home, a domestic violence a case, a a case of in the family, family, the livelihood. So we were able to get a hundred million dollars that the court system gives out in grants to legal service providers, legal aid, you know it as, to help poor people in civil cases so they can have a lawyer and that they can have their day in court. Justice shouldn't be about how much money you have in your pocket. It's supposed to be you know, we do justice, we wheel it, that the scales of lady justice are evenly balanced. So that's why it's not enough to have money. It has to be that you get justice, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, the color of your skin, or anything else. So again, the judiciary. The judiciary is a branch of government. The branch of government that's most concerned with equal justice is the one who pushed for that, uh, those monies and now we have $100 million, and the other thing we do is we also try and get lawyers to give of their time, to volunteer their time, pro bono, to again provide legal aid, legal services for poor people who can't afford their own lawyer. So those are some of the things. Let's go to the next, uh, next one, which will show you a little bit about the high court. Remember, the trial courts and the appellate courts. As the chief judge, I not only did all those kinds of initiatives that promoted equal justice, but we heard these cases that came up from those trial courts in New York City and outside that came up through the system and through the appellate division ultimately and then to the high court. And just to give you an example of the kinds of cases, let me tell you a little bit quickly about um, how the court works. There are seven judges in the high court. They're all nominated by a, a nomination commission, a merit system, and then the governor appoints them. And when we go up to Albany, we hear arguments on the cases. The next day, we conference those cases, we vote on them, and like six weeks later, a decision comes out, whether it's a criminal case or a civil case, as to what happened with that case. Um, it's, it's any kind of case you can imagine. This is the court of last resort in New York. You can't get any higher. The only other place you can go is if you appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States. Very few, few cases get up there from the New York courts or from any other state. But just to give you a sense of the kinds of cases, we had a case where, and most of these, all of these were ones where I wrote the decision, so I'm most familiar with them. We had a case where there was a challenge as to whether the governor, it was Governor Patterson at the time, as to whether he could appoint his own lieutenant governor. Because you remember when Governor Spitzer stepped down, Governor Patterson became the governor, and there was no lieutenant governor. So there was a constitutional issue as to whether Patterson could appoint a lieutenant governor, and we said he could in a four to three decision. So 
Very important case. The Barclays Center, how many of you, I'm sure you've all gone to events in the Barclays Center, concerts or a basketball game or a hockey game. We had a case as to whether there could be eminent domain, whether the government could take over the property where the Barclays Center was built and allow um, the, that uh, arena you know, to be built. And we decided, seven to nothing, that the government did have the power to do that. And as a result of that, certain people lost their homes because they had to leave, because the government could do eminent domain. But I'm trying to give you a sense of how important these cases are. GPS case, I wrote a four to three decision that said that, it was called the Weaver case, that said, if the police think you did something wrong, that they're suspicious about you or anybody else or, you know, someone in local government or anything, that we said the police cannot put a GPS under the bottom of your car so they know every place that you went because they think maybe you did something wrong. Why did we do it? Because what I said in the majority decision was that they can't invade your privacy. Because I have an inkling that, oh, you don't look, you look suspicious to me. And therefore, I'm going to say, you know, we're going to put a GPS under her car, and we're going to follow her. Every you wouldn't like that. I wouldn't like that. So we said you can't do that. A violation of your, your constitutional rights, your right to privacy. Indigent criminal defense that we talked about, getting lawyers for poor people in criminal cases. In another four to three decision, what we said was the present system, you can challenge the present system because sometimes the quality of the defense is so bad that it's like not having a lawyer. So we let them do that. And again, very important uh, case. It gives you a sense of the kinds of cases you get in the court system. You look at the newspaper, over 50% of the articles about things that in some way or another emanate from the justice system because your lives are so impacted by the courts here in New York City and this part of this big statewide court system. So let's look at a little bit about the, the breadth of what the court system does. So there are 350 courthouses around the state. It's a lot of courthouses. Uh, and about half of them in New York City, or more than about half of them outside the city, there are 1,300 judges here in New York City and outside that get paid by the state, and another 2,300 who are in those little town and, town and village courts that we talked about that dot the state. They could be in a local barber shop or in a garage. They're like these little, literally, local courts. Um, the court system has a $2.5 billion budget. You know that to support, look around here, you walk uh, anywhere, go, go a few blocks down over the Foley Square and you'll see a lot of uh, uh, city courthouses. It pays for those good. And we have over 15,000 employees that support the judges. You see the judge in the courtroom, those people support it in the clerk's offices, the clerk when you go into the courtroom, the court officer. So it's a very big system. So let's look at a couple of, of policy things now that come up in the courts. We are often understaffed because you know what? We can't print the money to run the court system. The state legislature and the governor give us the money. That sometimes has resulted in layoffs of court personnel we saying give us enough money and case backlogs that the caseloads are so big that it takes us too long to resolve the case. It could be years. You don't like it, we don't like it, but it's a product of that. The role of lawyers, we talked about this a little bit. The DAs represent the city, right, here in New York and outside the city, and they prosecute people in criminal cases. Well, remember we talked about criminal indigent defense? We need lawyers to represent the poor people. And you know, and again, we need the funds to do that. On the, on the, um, and there are sometimes private lawyers represent people in criminal cases. 
and often they're public lawyers appointed by the judge. Um, sometimes cases are multiple courts. It's such a complex court system. You could have in the, in the domestic relations area, you could have a case in the criminal uh, uh, courts for domestic abuse and violence, in the family court for support, and in the Supreme Court for a divorce. Three different courts involving the same people. And um, you know, sometimes you have to think about, as a lawyer, how you're going to process this case. What's the best way through this, this labyrinth? And, um, and that's why a lot of people have called, call, called for a merger of the courts, a consolidation of the courts so that we have one trial court instead of 11. And um, around the country, while the number of trial courts we, we, don't, we have is not necessarily admired, people do look to the courts in New York, the larger states, as to how courts should be run. So there's a lot of responsibility in the courts to sort of raise the flag around the country is what we, as to what is the best way to run the court system, um, or to run any court system. So let's go to the next uh, um, PowerPoint, which is really the last one, and it talks more about the role of the judiciary. Uh, what we do, the, the role of the judiciary is to serve the public. That's what we do. That's the one thing that matters is the court serve their client. Our client is all of you. It's the public. That's what we do. We're an independent branch of government. Now look at what's happening today. You remember when the president criticized the Mexican judge in that case, in the immigration case, and everyone went crazy? Or when the mayor here in New York City criticizes a court decision, we say, as a judiciary, we're independent. You can't tell us what to do. We have a tripartite system of government where we perform our role, the other two branches, remember the executive and the legislature perform their role, but what makes this system work is the fact that we're independent, that some disputes that no one can resolve even something as important as the presidency of the United States. You remember Gore versus Bush that ultimately went up to the United States Supreme Court because there was only one place where that could ultimately be resolved. Who was going to be the president? And that place is with the courts. So it's really an awesome responsibility to be the court of last resort, whether it's in New York whether it's in uh, Washington, D.C. And that's what we do. We resolve disputes. We're not Republicans. We're not Democrats. This is what we do. We're independent, but remember, we're also interdependent because the legislature and the governor do, does our budget. Remember, I said we have to lay off people sometime. So we work together, but there comes a time when you have a case that the only one who can resolve it, and you know what? Sometimes presidents and governors and mayors and people of the public don't like what the judiciary does. But that's what our system of government is. And we tell our judges, here in New York City and everywhere else, it goes with the terrain. If you can't take the heat, don't be a judge, because sometimes you go against this is where we go against, often, the majority of, of opinion. We don't take a vote and ask the public, gee, what should we do in this particular case? Put our finger up in the air and say, is it going to be popular? We do what the law tells us we must do. We're independent. That's the way our system works. And that's why we are so, uh, it's so important that we have respect for the rule of law and respect for the courts. That's what distinguishes this country from every other country in the world, that people accept what the courts do. Look at Gore v. Bush that we talked about. They'd be rioting in the streets in other countries. 
in the U.S. That was the law of the land. Some people didn't like it, but that was the law of the land. So that is what your courts in New York City do. That's what your courts in the rest of the state do and in the country. And I was proud to be the chief judge of the state overseeing all those courts, having two hats, one overseeing these the courts and how they run and how they serve the public, and the other one being the court of last resort in New York and being the chief of that court of seven judges that's the highest court in our state. So that's kind of your survey course, uh, Courts in New York City 101, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you have.